it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, this is, you're actually the first audience that I've gotten to talk to from your industry and, and from your standpoint. And, and I'm looking forward to it, um, not only sharing these ideas with you, but if we have a time getting some, some reflections from you about how your work interdigitates with the ideas in this. Um, and what we're, we'll see, what we're taking really is a long view, a very wide view of um, where we are in, in human development and where we are in human evolution. I first wrote this book with my father in 1981. It didn't attract much attention. Um, it sat around for a while. He died in 95. It was kind of sitting in the background. Um, but I was thinking about it because much of what we talked about seemed to be um, happening. Um, then a young man named David Duane called me and said, would you be interested in redesigning this, reissuing it? Um, and putting it out for a new generation. And I said yes, and so the, the book is the project of that. My father developed the first effective vaccine against polio in the 1950s. In the 1960s, he went on to found and help design the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, a renowned um, research institution, but also, as it turns out, one of the um, uh, architectural, man man sorry, architectural man masterpieces of the 20th century. What few people know is that he spent the last part of his life really thinking about and really trying to address human problems and bring the ideas of science to the greater issues of humankind. His wish was that his ideas be disseminated so that like a vaccine, they could bring the greatest good to the greatest number of people. And it's in that light and in that vein that I published the book and that I'm here to talk about it. The basic image of this book is the sigmoid growth curve. It consists of... Uh, a period of accelerating growth and decelerating growth and a point of inflection. We'll use it as a thinking tool, as an image through which to develop some ideas that can help talk about our current situation, our past, and our future. The horizontal axis represents time. The vertical axis represents number. There are two parts to the curve, an accelerating part, a decelerating part, separated by the point of inflection. We'll look at a couple of examples from laboratory models um, of this kind of growth, and then go on and, and look at human population. This is a classic experiment by Raymond Pearl in the 1920s, introducing a small number of fruit flies into a bottle. Um, and you can see that, that the growth increases, accelerates, slows, decelerates, and reaches a plateau. If you take a population of yeast and put them in a Petri dish, the same kind of thing happens. Um, and you see exactly the same curve. Okay, let's look at the human population. This is what our population growth curve looks like over the past 2,000 years. And um, you can see that pop the population grew very slowly and steadily up until about 200 years ago, 150 years ago, when the Industrial Revolution, the Technological Revolution, science and, and um, healthcare improved and agriculture improved, allowing people to live longer many more people being born than, than dying and um, able to sustain that number of people. Well, you look at this curve and you go, what's going to happen? Will it just continue to go up without cease? Will, on the other hand, some kind of disaster, some kind of cataclysmic set of conditions happen where we decimate our population and maybe even become extinct? Which, as we'll talk about a little bit, and as you know, is now actually much more possible than it was at the time that we first wrote the book. Or will it bend, it will it curve and reach a plateau like the population under experimental conditions? So let's look. This, here's population growth over the last 150 years. And you can see that it, it actually forms the, um, the shape of the, of the upturned curve. There's a period of acceleration. And here, actually, you can see that there's this, the growth is slowed um, and is beginning to turn to decelerating in the last 40, 50 years, if you look at the world population growth in, in total. Now, if you take the UN projections to the end of the century, um, it looks like this. And you can see the familiar sigmoid curve. If things bear out, according to those projections, we will plateau um, by the, toward the end of the century or the beginning of the next at a level of about 12 billion people, putting aside the fact that feeding and providing the, a world for 12 billion people is a challenge we don't know how to do. <laughs> but um, that, that's, where we're, that's where we're headed. Why does population growth slow? 
This is one of the actual great stories to me and I found in researching this book because it turns out that the factors that make population growth slow and make people decide to have fewer and fewer kids is number one, improvement in health care, reduction in infant mortality um, so that more children survive. Two, sustainable development, economic development, improvement in people's lives, and the education of women, especially the education of women, because they will then um, have more control over their reproductive lives and make decisions usually that end up deferring the birth of the first child till later and, and fewer things. What's great about this is it's a total win-win solution. If good things happen to people in parts of the world where the population is, is going up, if we help improve their lives, if they're able to improve their lives in these basic human ways, it has a dual effect. One is their lives get better, but it actually benefits accrue to us and accrue to the rest of the world because population growth, which really threatens us, will be slower. The more that we help these people, the more that we help in throughout the world with development and sustainable development, the sooner we'll plateau and we'll plateau at a lower level. Just a few quick slides. Infant mortality goes down. Birth rate goes down. Life expectancy goes up. Birth rate goes down. Female literacy goes up. Birth rate goes down. These are all statistics from India. This is, a, is an interesting slide visually. It's striking visually. It basically looks at a projection 8,000 years into the past and 8,000 years into the future. Now, I will readily confess I have no idea what the world population situation is going to be into the future. But partly for visual purpose and for, and for the purposes of looking at what a unique period of time we live in, um, this is, just makes that assumption. But what's striking is we are in what is an absolutely remarkable and unique period in the course of human history and human evolution. There is more rapid change in population size and probably more rapid change throughout um, our, our existence than at any time in the distant past and is likely ever to occur again. Now, when we wrote this book, we were at 6 billion people, which was right about there. Um, now we're at about 7 billion. Either way, we're right at the inflection point of this um, absolutely monumental change that's never occurred before, um, which makes this just, it, it partly explains the, the intense nature of our time, but it also gives us a sense of the importance of how we approach this. So now we'll abstract things a little bit, come back to the sigmoid curve, its two sections, the point of inflection. And what my father did intuitively was that he looked at this and he said, you know, wait a minute, these are actually two separate curves, an accelerating portion and a decelerating portion. And the first he called epic A, the second epic B. And the basic idea is that the world looks very different if you're born and living in epic A with no limits, expansion, um, the, that leads to a number of attitudes, values, and behaviors that are adaptive to that situation. But the world looks very different in Epic B. And it's easy to see that things that may be advantageous in Epic A will not be advantageous in Epic B and vice versa. Simplest example, resource development. In Epic A, things seemed absolutely limitless. We could consume, there was unfettered consumption, unfettered disposal of waste, um, and then that changed. And in Epic B, it's a totally different situation. So that there's no limits consuming and waste in Epic A. This transforms in Epic B to a matter of limits, conservation, and the, the whole concept of sustainability. The same thing is true in terms of children at a different level. The quality of each child's life becomes important rather than the total number of children. And so that there's a, a change in child rearing practices and families um, throughout and even in, in uh, wider policies. Now this kind of change goes on beyond this into other ha attitudes, values, and behaviors. So that in Epic A, it's totally appropriate and advantageous to compete. Those who competed the best, wielded the most power, um, were the most independent, were the ones who succeeded. This is true on national level, on corporate level, and on individual level. In the very different conditions of Epic B, however, what's going to help us survive both individually and as a group and as a species is actually increased reliance on collaboration, 
independence, interdependence, um, and reaching consensus. The simplest and most dramatic example of this is dealing with climate change. Um, this is not a problem that's going to go away if we're each competing with the other for the remaining resources. Um, if we're going to solve this problem, and it's one that, that is huge, it's going to be through interdependence and collaboration among people all over the, all, all over the world. The Paris um, Accords were an example of this. 200 countries, more than 200 countries, signing on to the same agreement, um, it, something that has never happened before. And that's what's necessary. I'll leave aside the asterisk that we've, as a country, have withdrawn from those accords. And I hope that we'll be able to con con correct that soon. Epic A, a time of persistent expansion. Epic B, a time of dynamic equilibrium. But it's important to say it won't be a stagnant equilibrium that will continue to be developed in technology and the quality of human life and in human endeavor. Last in this series of slides is um, a more philosophical concept, one that ranges across a lot of things, but especially conflict resolution. Epic A being a time of either or. What, it, what accrues to me is a loss to you, and what accrues to you is a loss to you. There will really be a kind of paradigm shift in adapting to the state of slowing growth and equilibrium to both and and either or thinking and solutions. Now, this is not going to happen without a great deal of conflict. If you think about it, this is a sea change in, in so many aspects of our lives. So um, we'll talk about that. I want to just take a side trip for a second and explain um, how this change may happen from generation to generation. When we first wrote this book, I thought, this kind of change is going to happen over multiple generations as a slow evolutionary process. But as I began thinking about it, as I was working on the book the second time around, I realized that the, actually it's happening much faster than I thought. Um, and I realized that my kids are growing up in a different environment from what I grew up in. So this shows three generations mapped against where they fall in the sigmoid curve. The Depression generation, my parents' generation, was born and essentially lived out most of their lives under Epic A conditions. My generation, the baby boom generation, we were born in Epic A conditions. I was born in 1950. The sky was the limit. Anything could be done. There was no real concern, aside from sort of a romantic idea of conservation, um, about it affecting our survival. So, um, but halfway through our lives, that began to change. Um, in the 60s and 70s, the whole concept of there being limits, limited resources, um, the effects of pollution, all of that kind of exploded. And around the time we passed the inflection point, and so we lived out our other half of our lives under Epic B conditions, which parenthetically, I think, explains some of the I don't know what to call it, the schizophrenia of my generation, the conflicts, the ways that we screwed up. Um, we had great ideals, and then we all sort of began operating in a selfish way. Um, we're kind of a hybrid generation. The millennial generation, um, which includes me many or most of you and my children, grew up in an entirely different situation. From the very time my children were born, they understood that the world had limited resources. They understood about recycling, they now understand about climate change. And they actually understand in ways, I think, that's different from previous generations about collaborating and working together um, and dealing with diversity. So really, in my lifetime, in a way that I hadn't anticipated, things are changing. And I think a kid that grows up has a different nervous system, has a different social set, has a different set of values um, because of, of growing up under those conditions. OK, so back to conflict. We as human beings are capable of both epic A and epic B behaviors. What comes out, what is manifest, depends on what the environment is and what's advantageous. So that in epic A, the epic A values predominate, and in epic B, the epic B values predominate. One of the things about this is that it changes. What changes is, in epic A, what was pragmatic, pragmatic profitable, seemed to be wise and necessary, was one thing, and what was, what was humane was another. So a lot of hand-waving, it's all very nice, tree-huggers, um, loving everyone in, in, in the world, 
integrating and pulling people together. But those just weren't seen as practical. And so strategies went on um, without that. In the very different conditions of Epic B, it actually turns out happily that what's humane and what's right for people's well-being is also what's pragmatic. It's what's going to probably make profits. It's also what's going to be right for our survival. A simple way of putting this is we're entering a time where generosity serves self-interest. Paradoxically, they become the same thing, which is a tremendous opportunity for us as a, as a species, um, and one that on the positive days I'm pretty excited about. But in this area of inflection, um, growth rates are the highest, acceleration is changing to decelerization, deceleration, values are shifting most rapidly. The period it can be expected to be a time of increased conflict. Which brings us to this slide. Um, what it does is it schematizes the change from epic A values being predominant, them decreasing epic B values becoming more and more important around the point of inflection that's switching and moving to a time where epic B values are predominant over epic A values. Now what's useful to me about this slide is you look at this and I realize a lot of things begin to make sense. One thing that makes sense is why um, we see such polarization and why we're divided into kind of two groups of, of, of opinions and, and different strategies for the future. We're, this is a time of tremendous uncertainty. And what I actually come to understand is, in the face of that uncertainty, vast numbers of people, millions of people, are saying, whoa, wait a minute. I don't know what the hell is going to happen. Let's go back to what worked before. Let's go back to isolationism. Let's go back to um, either our thinking. Let's go back to being as independent as possible and saying, looking out for us and not them. Um, let's go back to fossil fuels. <laughs> um, I can actually understand this, and I think it's something that we all need to be sensitive to in the part of this change. It's a very human reaction to that uncertainty. But at the same time, what we've got is a vast swath of people who are not looking at it like that. And, and I, in my optimistic days, think reaching a, soon to be reaching a critical mass of, of people um, like yourselves, many of you, who look f are saying, let's go forward. We don't know what this is going to look like, but we know what basic values we have to, to, to work out. Let's work out all the details of it. Let's, but let's go forward and adapting to the future rather than the past. So this conflict is what's getting played out worldwide at this point, the conflict between Epic A thought and Epic B thought. And my hope, I, I will confess, is that while we've seen a rise in populism, uh, a certain kind of populism, over the past five, 10 years, that what we're seeing is basically the last gasp of those Epic A values, and that we'll soon be evolving out of that. It's not assured, um, but it's a possibility. If you look at things just in the short term, from day to day, week to week, month to month, even decade to decade, things look chaotic. This is what the world looks like for me every morning when I get up and read the paper um, or listen to the news. It's just like, oh my god, what's going to happen? And I just have no idea. Um, however, if with the use of the curve, standing back and looking at the long term, it begins to make a little more sense. And rather than being a time of blooming, buzzing confusion, this is a time of an almost expected and predictable time of conflict and, um, and uncertainty. Um, but it's part of a natural evolutionary or developmental process. And there's a way out. There's a, there's a, it indicates a direction. This I leave in. Sometimes I take it out, but I leave it in because I also wake up every morning and realize this is all too possible. If we cling to the epic A values too long, we're going to cause natural disaster, or we're going to end up in some kind of conflagra conflagration of conflict. Um, that really stands the potential for decimating not only our species, but all the species in the world. Okay, so let's look at the last part of the talk. It's looking at resolution and integration. How are we going to go about this? Spoiler alert, I'm painting this in broad, <laughs> in, in, in broad things. I'm not making policy change, but um, 
let's look and see what we can think about and begin in this process. So in this critical period, we're responsible for getting our species and guiding our species to a new equilibrium. So what this means is parameters for growth and how we measure growth and how we measure progress is, needs to shift and I think will shift from a quantitative view, looking at GDP, measuring it by economic growth. I mean, if you stop and think about it, if you look at the long term, we can't keep growing forever. So we're going to need um, ways of measuring, ways of looking at progress, and, and ways of measuring progress that aren't quantitative in the same way. Or we need to quantify issues of human and planetary well-being. Um, and if those become the values and those become the measures, we can continue to progress and go forward. But it requires a huge, a huge shift in, in systemic thinking and individual thinking. Energy transitions, this is kind of an easy one. Um, lovely to hear about the zero carbon um, situation with Google. Um, and this is increasingly happening um, for important reasons. But going from carbon intensive fossil fuels to low energy, um, I'm sorry, low carbon emissions and alternative sources of energy. One thing that I think about is the basic drivers of, of technological development, um, and I assume, although I want to hear from you with, co with companies like yours, is in Epic A, this was all driven by what was to be of economic advantage, what was going to make the most accrual for corporations. Obviously, that hasn't stopped, um, in essence. But over time, I would like to see, and I think our survival depends on, making the issues of planetary well-being and human well-being and the well-being of other species to be the drivers of that directs us what problems are we going to look at, what problems are we going to solve. Just to return, just to, to mention again where we are, this is such a, a time of, of change. We're just past the point of inflection. Um, a lot is under our control, and a lot we can still do. I'm going to take one last diversion here and just say one other aspect of this model that I personally find very interesting. We've been looking at this section, the sigmoid curve section. If you extend it out into the past and into the future, our, the conditions of our um, evolution and the, the, the way that the human organism and human society evolved was under conditions of relative equilibrium in terms of population, but also in terms of the relationship with the environment. So people had ways of coping in economies that are much more like what we're talking about today, but in entirely different conditions. What we're looking at in the future is another time of relative equilibrium, where we're living in a relatively closed system, where things are, are not shifting, and we have to have a dynamic in integration and a dynamic interaction with that system. What this means, and I think is very cool, is that we actually have a lot to learn from traditional um, and even hunter-gathering hunter societies. That the way people adapted and the way our organisms adapted in those ways, there are lessons to be learned. And we have the creative um, challenge of doing that at a level of a higher population, a totally different uh, socioeconomic situation, a totally different technological situation. But is there a way we can integrate those values? Once again, just going from a place where A and B were integrated to where they came apart, looking at a time of reintegration and a time of balance. A few more examples. There was a divergence between what was a material value and what was human value. These were in conflict. We're moving into a time where we're looking at both material value and human value. Consumption or conservation leading up to a time of sustainability. Um, and integration, as I mentioned, between the modern way of life and the traditional way of life. In the area of human creativity, academics, human discipline, there became this big split between mind and body. There's this big split between reason and intuition um, cognition and emotion, and the arts and the sciences, once again coming together in an integrative way. So as we are making this change, it's going to affect every aspect of our lives, everything from the individual right down to the molecular biological functioning of our nervous systems, all the way up through new systems for community, new systems for um, 
social and political and economic systems, international relations, and eventually uh, the planet as a whole. So I'm talking about something that I think is, is, is happening, that can happen and will happen, but it involves changing everything um, and really changing it, everything in sort of radical ways, but creative ways from how we've been doing it for the past at least several hundred, if not several thousand years. So just in conclusion, this change happens at every level. We all can participate in it. We all can be part of this change and help it work, whether it's in the context of our own families and how we raise our children, um, affecting us in the neurobiological level, because you know, any change like this is going to affect really how nervous systems are set up. There was change at the family level, whether we're seeing how our family works and how our family relates with other families, to the community and work level. And again, I think we've seen this with companies like yours. It's a totally different kind of work organization and a totally different kind of work environment than what we had before. Um, so this stuff is actually happening. It's not just totally abstract. Social, economic, and political systems are going to have to change. Um, and we already mentioned that, particularly in, in economic systems. We need an economic system that is based around equilibrium and not about material growth. International relations, um, we may be looking at wildly different things, but certainly in the near term, diff different ways that we can, we can interact as nations and as groups of people, all the way up to our relationship with the environment, with our planet, with other species. So we're going from a time where everything was known, where everything was, romantically speaking, was kind of simple, but familiar. And we're at a time of uncertainty where we don't know where we're going. I prefer to think of it, however, rather than being unknown, as a time to be created. And that we all are in a situation where we are responsible for and we can design our future. Um, it's not exactly a blank state, slate, but it is pretty blank. And rather than being intimidated, I think it's a particularly exciting and remarkable time to be alive. So in conclusion, just to say, we're at this point in the course of human social evolution where the demands of survival converge with the higher ideals of humankind and the well-being and flourishing of human society. It's up to us to see that we navigate this transition, adapting to and emerging in a new reality. So thank you for listening and giving me a feedback. Thank you for the talk. Uh, first of all, I, I just want to congratulate you in having so few words and so much content. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the slides were amazing. The, the pictograph was very, oh, well, very illuminating. I, and I, that was my father's aesthetic, and it came through. Excellent. Good. <laughs> uh, my point here is I think the message is very clear, um, but it also kind of reflects well uh, the way Americans see the current situations. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were to give the same talk, let's say, in China, mm -hmm. uh, I would expect that they would kind of look at you a bit strange and say, wait a minute, no, 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 this is not how we see things. I think they are very much in the A portion, mm -hmm. especially because some government decisions delayed the, the explosion of population growth, and therefore they're still mm -hmm. behind in that respect. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the friction uh, at the international policy level comes from, from that particular aspect of of various nations being at different points in the inflection curve that you're showing. Uh, do you, how do you, do you agree with this view? And also, do you plan on kind of, let's say, doing something like this on an international scale so that you would at least gather insights from what other people think? Um, great point, great question. And yes, I agree with you right down the line. <clears throat> I, a big aspect of this is in, if you just look at the demographics, throughout the world, we're at different points in this curve. In the developed world, we're actually at the plateau of the curve, and in countries like um, uh, Germany, to some extent the United States, population is even declining. So we've moved through all of that. On the other end of the spectrum, there are countries where it's just beginning, um, where population growth is still very, very rapid. Um, uh, Nigeria, Uganda. Um, and 
the, this kind of what's called a demogra demographic transition is just occurring. And then there are countries like China and India which are moving toward it and are actually in the, in, the, in the slowing part of the curve, but in the early slowing part of the curve rather than later. So that's definitely true. And I think each of those countries is then at a different place in terms of the social evolution that we're talking about. Um, and I think it's very important and obviously in, in many ways to understand and be sensitive to um, other countries and, and other societies that are in a totally different state of development um, and understand and figure out a way to work through that. I would love to present and to get feedback from, from people in the rest of the world because I think there are lots of things that, that people will go, wait a minute. I also suspect there are lots of things where people are going to go, you know what, this makes sense. Um, the, the easiest example is in China, the effects of pollution, the effects of waste disposal were ignored for many, many years. There's a lot of feedback from the environment that says we need to place different value on that. Um, and at my most idealistic, we may be, you know, China could become the leader in the world of, of alternative technologies. It's something that the, as, a, as a society they have the, the, the capacity to do. So um, that's my take on that. But thank you. Thank you. So you seem to indicate that we just uh, passed the inflection point mm -hmm. um, collectively uh, as a planet. I was curious, like, uh, how confident are people in general that we are going to stabilize at 10 or so billion versus, you know, 50 billion people, you know? Um, I would say very confident, um, you know, barring things. I mean, basically, there's evidence that we passed the point of inflection. Again, e easily put, basically, growth rates have peaked worldwide and are on the decline. Mathematically, that just defines having passed the inflection point on the curve. Um, and we've got places where gro growth rates are, so on the statistics are escaping me, but like 2.2 to 3. Um, and we have places where it's basically zero. But uh, there's a lot of confidence that this phenomenon, that things are slowing, um, is happening. There is the danger that it's going to be at 15 million as opposed to 12. Um, and so there's a lot to be done in the area of demographics, and it's not such a popular um, idea. But the idea of um, improving conditions and slowing population at this point will make a tremendous difference in the impact and the problems that we're going to have to deal with farther down the line. Um, so talking about the difference between like developing country and developed country, um, so um, in, in developing country like China, um, as we satisfy the material needs, then the mental health problem become a serious problem. As a psychologist, do you have, can you share a thought on how we can collaborate to uh, adjust that problem? Um, yes, I can. <laughs> I can do my best. Um, you know, obviously something I think about a lot. From one perspective, um, you're absolutely right. Looking at mental health, looking at psychological well-being was a luxury that you can't afford to pay much attention to when you don't have enough to eat, when you don't have a place to live. Um, so those things fall by the wayside. So that there's an increase in interest and an increase in opportunity of that. I think there have to be cultural shifts to support that. Um, and I think that there have to be enough um, support, whether it's at a cultural level or whether it's at an interventionist level, like a psychiatry or psychologist, to help with that. But I think the biggest thing that I think in, 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 with respect to this is preventive, looking at prevention of mental health problems, looking at, at everything from prenatal care and birth issues to how children are raised. because. I do believe, as a psychiatrist, um, that much of what happens in our nervous systems is vastly and wildly ex um, affected by experience in the first three to five years of life. It's not necessarily deterministic, but it sure as hell lays the foundation. Um, and I think, you know, if I can wax idealistic for a moment, I, I actually really believe that there's a direct correlation between children's experiences and social and economic systems. Um, 
capitalism is based on uh, suspicion that you're not going to get back what you've invested. It's based on kind of scarcity or taking, a, taking opportunity with abundance. Children can have the difference, let's say, between learning, you know, this is, this is mine. You know, this is, this is dad's drink. <laughs> um, or sharing it. More to the point, um, in, the, in, in traditional societies, children in physical contact with, with a caregiver, um, babies, as much as 70, 80 percent of the time. In industrialized countries, at least in the past, they've been in physical contact with people for like 15 to 20 percent of the time. I think that affects a child psychologically, but I think that it affects a child neurobiologically in terms of the, the inner regulation of their emotions. So um, I, I could wax on that for a while, but um, I think it's a tremendous issue. This is, this is really great. I, I like how you started um, with the sigmoid curve connecting with biology and transition to how that is um, reflected in our values and kind of the information in our culture. Uh, do you have any examples from biology of um, other organisms kind of navigating that sigmoid curve and showing behaviors that that kind of model what we're trying to go for in our human society where uh, like what's good for the individual is good for the group or is it is it just you know like they're just peeking out with the resources and it's just all fierce competition because you know fruit flies like they're sophisticated uh -huh. <laughs> right so if you have examples from biology I would I would love to hear about that um, it's a good question and uh, you know frankly one I've never thought much about but off offhand um, I, I, you put your finger on it in an interesting thing, which actually I think always affected my father, because there's a way in which with the fruit flies it's just a mathematical change. It's not like the fruit flies got together and say, "Hey, let's take care of the space anymore." But he actually um, had a little bit of poet in him, and so he felt that um, there was that that biology. He talked about it in a broad sense of metabiology. But he felt like there's a wisdom to natural law and natural processes. And so he would look at that curve, um, and I would go, Dad, it's just numbers. And he would kind of go, well, I'm not so sure. There's a kind of wisdom in nature th that affects this. So that's responding to one, one thing. I don't know. It's a great question. Um, obviously, social creatures. Um, are, are a better, a different example from, from creatures that are operating just completely independently. So I think we, you know, you have to look to the primates, potentially to social instinct, um, insects, um, and look at that. And I think it's a great question. Um, great talk. Um, I kind of wanted to ask on kind of a, maybe a silly topic of, um, with like space exploration. Uh -huh. um, like if Elon Musk had his way, we'll be on Mars in no time. Uh -huh. um, and kind of, I guess, the great expansion of, of resources and stuff like that, that'll perhaps thrust us back into a new uh, epic A. Uh -huh. um, and perhaps the one set of values of, you know, or and of, you know, you know, risk and, and cost will resurge. And obviously that'll be a very different time because not only will that be kind of a new point of crossing a, a, another point of inflection back into to the epic, but it's one that we created all on our own. Uh -huh. um, and I kind of wanted to ask how, it, it, you know, how much you've kind of thought into uh, a resurgence in, in those values into, and into a new epic A. Um. I have thought about it some, um, and it's a, it's, it's a really interesting concept. I, on, on one level, basically, this, all, this whole talk assumes that we're not, that we don't have a planetary place to expand. I think you're quite right. If we then enter into new conditions or new um, ecological niches are available to us, we'll go through another cycle of, of that um, accelerating increase and then decelerating increase. Um, if we do it more consciously and awarely, uh, with more awareness, um, we may avoid some of the problems that we're having now. So that's part of it. I will say, though, um, again, my father actually felt like 
evolution was something that went through many, many, many um, processes of this. So he saw our evolution from the pre-biological to the biological to the social as a series of these, a plateau and then another sigmoid curve and then another sigmoid curve. Um, so, uh, so yes. One point I wanted to make was, uh, it, for Google, for instance, it's all about metrics. So you define the metrics that are of interest to you, and then you guide your decisions uh, according to, to those metrics and how you can increase the metrics. And if I look now at, at the situation, um, let's say from a legislative kind of way, is uh, the, uh, the officers of a company, CEO and everybody else, they have a fiduciary obligation uh, to the shareholders uh, to increase the value of the company and all that. Mm -hmm. and, and that basically is very much a curve uh, yes. related, right? So, and, and if, if we keep those metrics in place, it basically means that we're going to screw ourselves up mm -hmm. according to this, right? Uh, which, which basically implies that if we are to do something meaningful, we would need, to, uh, in respect to the B curve, we would need to go all the way back to the level of changing some of the laws and some of the obligations that enforce some of these people to take decisions. If I'm a CEO, I will, I will, I will make a decision. I will be obligated to make a decision, even if I don't agree with it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. so, so you would need a fundamental change at the level of, the, of, of this kind of constraint. Right. Um, probably the, you know, one of the most pressing and, and important and complicated problems there is. I'll respond in, in two ways. Or uh, what I think is this is liable to happen in two phases is how I think about it. Because if there's one phase that's kind of an intermediate phase, which is um, corporate responsibility um, and looking at, at corporate responsibility uh, and also the, the profit and loss um, balance sheet may change so that, in fact, operating in different ways that are less quantitative result in in, is a better way to get, make, make profits and to make money than operating in an Epic A way. So I think that some of that's going to happen. Basically, renewable energy likely will become cheaper and cheaper and actually become cost effective. And then you've got that shift. There's probably another level to this that I think about, but in a very fumbling way, which is it's really trying to picture an economy um, where, where, and people talk about circular economies, regenerative economies, there's a lot of people who are thinking about this, um, where there's, there's a much more basic change in the whole economic system. Um, and that's probably the best answer I can give you about that. Um, I see it as, as, a, as an, the biggest creative challenge that we have, is exactly how to do that and how to work that out. Um, and all I can say is I think there's a way but that's, and I think that we need to define that as a goal um, and, you know, easy enough to, to work out the details. But that's a great question. Well, thank you very much. It was really a pleasure to be here.